your audience shouldn't be people who love tabletop games. Your audience, ne you need to narrow it down to like people who are familiar with this and want this sort of experience, you know? People who want a game about exploring the emotions of space, the vastness of space. But also it's got to be a two-player game, you know? And you've got to hone in on that and figure out how do I make the game that appeals to those people? What are the essential functions of a two-player game? Because if you try to do the like, I'm making the game that everyone's going to play, you're going to make a muddled mess, unfortunately. Hi, welcome to the Daiku Podcast. I'm Gary Snow. Today, I welcome Adam Jury, who is responsible for the partner relations at Drive Through RPG. And Adam is also the co-founder and co-owner of Post Human Studios, an award-winning game publisher of Eclipse Phase. Adam brings with him years of experience publishing, which he now uses to help support aspiring game designers. Adam, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. Well, I'm really happy that you could join us today because uh, one of the things that I really liked about what Drive Through RPG is doing is really empowering game designers. And uh, last summer, you did Pocket Quest 2022. That was the first one ever. Yes. And uh, I just wanted to ask you, how did that go last year? It went really great. Um, we ended up with over uh, 70 new titles as part of the game jam. And the uh, the theme for 2022 was summer camp. Um, and we ended up, uh, at least 60 of those titles were from people who hadn't published on Drive Through RPG before. So not only were some of them making their first game and learning about like revisions and play testing and trying to squish it into 20 pages. Um, but also they were learning about the drive through RPG publisher interface and how to get things uploaded and cover sizes and stuff like that at the same time. So definitely a learning experience for a lot of them and a learning experience for us running the first one as well. And, and you know, game jams have been like getting more and more popular uh, over time. And your experience too just maybe talk us through your experience of how you uh like were a game designer yourself and a publisher and then ended up at drive through rpg um so my experience uh wow i started um I, first I, I started by publishing a fanzine in the in the late 90s on the internet um before social media before everything like that when you know you had your good old everyone had their own individual homepage sort of thing um, and based on that, I got to, you know, know some people in the industry and I did some writing on the Shadowrun line and I quickly kind of realized that honestly, uh, I'm not a very good writer. I'm not, I'm certainly not a fast enough writer. And so, but what I did enjoy was, uh, doing graphic design and the layout and like making things work together. So I got into that and, uh got my first job at Guardians of Order in the early 2000s as a full-time gaming job. That lasted a couple years, and then I turned into a full-time freelancer. I worked a lot with FanPro and Catalyst on the Shadowrun Battletech lines. Um, and then myself and a longtime creative partner, Rob Boyle, with a couple other people, we founded Post Human and published a couple editions of Eclipse Phase. We've run some Kickstarters. We're still doing that stuff. We have an ongoing Patreon. Um, but we were also, both of us were a little, um, looking for a little more stability than what the publishing life can offer as an indie publisher. And Rob's been doing a bunch of computer game writing over the past couple of years, which is really sweet. Um, and I applied at drive through and got, got a partner relations job, then publisher relations, now partner relations. And, uh, it's been really cool to, to, you know, cause I've been doing this for over 20 years now. And it's, it's, it's really fun and rewarding to take people through the process of this is how you publish. Like, here's these weird tools that you use. This is why this happens this way. Hey, maybe you should try this marketing opportunity that you've never done before, you know? Like, and it's, I think it's good to, that I have had direct experience in doing these things myself as opposed to, uh, you know, so when you when you when you deal with some companies, you're definitely dealing with somebody who's like they're right on the script because they don't know anything but the script. And I'm, 
I can I can do the script, but also I can go off script and you know share personal experiences and that sort of thing. So it's a, a lot of fun, and I I think good for the publishers that I deal with. Cool. And then just what kind of uh, like ro- like your role? Like what what do you do on a day to day basis with uh, game designers or publishers? So- I handle um, all sorts of incoming emails from publishers, everything from really basic questions. Like I can't figure out how to generate a sales report. I'm like, oh, here's a sales report tool. Here's an example. Let me know if that works for you or do you need something else? Um, and we, uh, we promote um, our partners Kickstarters for them. And I handle sending out a lot of those emails on behalf of the partners. So that's like kind of the first thing I do every day is like, who am I sending emails for? And then who sent me an email that needs to be sent tomorrow going through that. But a lot of my job is just emails from partners dealing with everything from a technical issue on the site, answer a lot of questions about our print on demand program. Um, and dealing with our community content programs for like Miskatonic Repository, for example, where you can publish Call of Cthulhu compatible stuff with Chaosium's Blessing, handle um, people dealing with that for the first time. It really it really runs the gamut from like really some really simple questions. How do I upload a new logo to I ran a sales report for 2007 And I noticed that four copies of this book were given out for free and I don't understand why. Can you explain? And I'm like, okay, let's figure this out. You know, when I dive in and do a data dive and like, oh, these orders were to our reviewers or you sent those complimentary copies yourself. You know, it was 2007. I don't blame you for not remembering. Yeah. Um, Cool. Well, it yeah. sounds like it sounds like uh, game designers are in good hands. You've got the experience, you know the tools very well, and you're able to guide them. And uh, the support from Drive Through RPG, which I mean, I think anybody watching this channel obviously knows Drive Through RPG, and it's like the de facto place to go to get uh, games uh, digitally and a print on demand in particular. Uh, but the uh, the Pocket Quest, as we kind of alluded to earlier. 2022 that was the first one went really well and i remember i wasn't too sure how it was going to go but when i watched it and i saw on the home page the landing page and i saw some of the pocket quest uh games up there and people were having a lot of success and having a lot of fun and i'm also uh on the discord server uh which i'll have links to in the description below for people that are interested in joining it and there's the pocket quest channel and you could just see the community that was being built around pocket quest a- absolutely. So uh, before we dash onto that, I do want to mention that in the partner relations department, it's not just me. Um, we also have the excellent uh, Meredith Gerber, uh, Carrie Jo Fruderman, and uh, Brooke Whitney, who just joined the team recently. And they are all great. And we bounce things off each other and have good discussions on how to help publishers and whatnot. So it's uh, it's definitely a real team effort in partner relations. And uh that's also a, a really great part of the job is getting to spend time with great coworkers and publishers. But yeah, Pocket Quest last year really we had obviously we'd set some internal goals for like, you know, we would like to see so many new publishers, we'd like to see so many titles and we exceeded all of those goals, but also I definitely think the people on social media talking about it and the discord channel and whatnot. I really thought that was hopping and more than I expected. Um, and that's continuing this year with people brainstorming their initial titles. And, uh, you know, there's people talking about, Oh, I play tested my game last night and it didn't go quite like I hoped. So I'm, I'm tweaking some stuff for next week sort of thing. So it's really cool to see that process. Cool. And let me bring up, uh, this year's Pocket Quest, and you already mentioned the the theme is space, whereas uh, last year it was uh, summer camp, and there's like so many cool titles. But, you know, it's like I think one in particular that jumped out at me was this Psionics uh, sl- Sleepaway Camp or something like that. Anyways, there's some yeah. like really fun titles on there. But so Pocket Quest with the theme of space this year, just kind of walk us through kind of the overall goal of uh, or the theme in general. Well, I mean, the theme is space, not of this world. So it's very wide open. Um, people, I know there's a, there's people who are, who are making games that are uh, kind of like 
traditional space stories with a little twist. Um, all sorts of things going on, and I can I can talk about a few of the specific ones I've heard about. And we already have, like I think, like six or eight partners who have already finished a game and uploaded it. And we're just waiting for the uh, the uh, July first date to release them. Um, one, of the, one of the things I liked uh, from last year because it was like this, you know, the summer camp theme was the the merit badges, and I'm glad to see that you kept them for this year. Even though it's yes. not quite as obvious, but it's kind of, you know, space badges on your spacesuit or whatever. But yeah, absolutely. And uh, all of that and all of these graphics and stuff were done by uh, Sandra, who's in our production department. And Sandra's kind of like one of our unsung heroes um, in terms of getting stuff done and making it look good. Uh, and also in getting a lot of print on demand books on the site that are like old wizards titles and comic books and a lot of stuff. Sandra's got a, a huge hand in that. So it was really cool to see her like in the space of like a week, just like whip up all this pocket quest stuff. It was like, Whoa, dang. Like you didn't even, you didn't start that you started and finished it. Like, so, um, yeah. And of course we've got, we've got the merit badges for different achievements and that publishers can update their title and the title listing when they hit those. Uh, so uh, definitely a little bit of cheering each other on and also helping each other get the badges. You know, you can get a badge for collaborating with somebody else, for example. So it's a good way to get some more eyes on your game. It's like, hey, I'll play test your game, you play test my game sort of thing. And so some of the criteria are uh, no no longer than 20 pages, which is perfect because, uh, you know, they always say perfection is the enemy of uh, getting things done because... Sometimes short and sweet is just enough to get your uh, toe in the water and kind of go, okay, I'm designing my first game and it's just keep it short and sweet. Right. And, and like, I mean, that's to me a general piece of advice that I offer to anyone who's trying to get into game design or publishing is like, don't start with this one project that is like the thing you've been thinking of for 15 years and you're, it's like your ultimate dream because you're going to learn so much the first time you do something, start with something smaller. And it, it, it seems, it kind of seems a little backwards, but start with something that is not so heavy investment wise to you emotionally, because then you can, fail and learn with your first project and be like, okay, that's done. Now I can start again. It's better to start and finish three small things than start and nearly get to the end of one big thing. Um, and I mean, in, in general, tabletop game design tends to, as, as you work on something, it increases in scope and complexity, both for good and bad reasons, to be honest. Um, so starting with a small goal that's achievable in only a couple months is, is I think very important to get people in and getting the satisfaction of finishing something and completing a whole loop. And the deadline to have everything uploaded, uh, to drive through RPG is July 1st at that's, 10 AM Eastern time. That's correct. Canada day. That's right. Yeah. And I'm coming from Canada. So I don't know if you remember that, but thanks for calling that out. But yeah, uh, I, I'm know. from Canada too. I don't live there anymore, but. Well, you're maybe smart on that sometimes. <laughs> I mean, I live in Minnesota. It's basically like Canada. Oh yeah, that's like uh, the suburb of Canada. Pretty much. Um, but so July 1st, uh, you have to have it uploaded. And does that like, it? there's an approval process for any new, kind of new publisher, right? Like uh, does the approval process have to be done by July 1st or just uploaded? It just needs to be uploaded and we will definitely in late June be prioritizing getting all of the pocket quest stuff um, ready to ready to all launch so they can all go together. And the approval process is not as scary as it sounds. Essentially, it's us doing a technical check to make sure the cover's the right size, the file downloads correctly and loads the title descriptions are right. This isn't us going through and being like, oh, you made a mistake on page three. Sorry. You know, this is this is just us making sure that it, it, it's ready to go live. A little bit of an insurance policy for new publishers. Yeah, just quality control, making sure that everything is in the right place and named right and the files yeah. look right. Um, and then, but prior to that, uh, if 
you know, lots of people uh, buy off a of drive through RPG, but you need a publisher account, correct? Like people need to upgrade that account. Yes. Yes. You need to upgrade to a publisher account for this. And then um, obviously, you know, there's a marketing around it to hopefully get some extra traction, uh, hashtag pocket quest. And there's some templates, which I always appreciate about drive through RPG is there's templates that people can download. So in case you're uh, like, Starting right from scratch, I know you have affinity templates and InDesign templates. Yeah, and there's a there's a Word template as well, um, which would obviously work in LibreOffice or a bunch of free Office software. So, um, people people have lots of options. And then, uh, sorry to cut you off, but there are also even just like the game system. Like, there's a lot of uh, Creative Commons game. Uh, rules and SRDs that people can tap into. Just off of the top of my head, there's the Year Zero engine. I know some people use that. There's now the like the new OGL, and so there's lots of options for people to pull from. Yeah, we do encourage people in Pocket Quest to be designing their own system um, and not pulling too much from an SRD or anything like that. But we're uh, we're not going to police that per se. Well, the, the problem is once you get a heavy, heavy system, uh, you know, it eats up 20 pages pretty quick. So, right, right. And I, I, I definitely have seen, I was, I, you know, I was skimming through, I, I asked people yesterday, like, hey, tell me, tell me a few sentences about your game. And I've seen like people with tarot card systems and regular playing card systems and just stuff that is generally lower impact. Because if you only have 20 pages, you need to be able to describe basically your core mechanic in two to four pages maximum. And generally speaking, last year, were they mostly kind of perfect bound uh, products and like 20 pages or were some of them just digital only? I think almost all of them last year were digital only. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is last year we only gave people a month to do it. And this year we expanded it to two months to give people a little more time and a little more time for people to, to discover it. Because if, if somebody didn't hear about Pocket Quest until two weeks in last year, they were kind of in a rough spot. But this year, more warning, it's the second year, and a little bit more time for people to stretch out. Um, it's still two months is kind of short for designing something completely and getting print ready on our site because... Uh, a print book has to go through a different approval process and then the publisher needs to order a proof copy and get that. And that can take two weeks, three weeks, sometimes depending on where they are in the world. Okay. So the, the PDF that I have up on the screen, I'm going to put a link to it because uh, you can actually download download this right from Drive Through RPG. So I know it's probably small on the screen here, but just to give you a sense of what's available there. And then uh, once again, I can't encourage you enough to go to the Discord server, which I'll have links in the description to go there, check out the community, uh, go to the Pocket Quest channel and just see what everybody else is up to because it's a really good supportive community and everybody is like helping each other out and throwing ideas around. And, you know, at the end of it all, like, I mean, this the community is what helps each other. Um, obviously, my channel is almost entirely devoted to indie game design. And it's important that indie game designers kind of support each other. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that, that's been really nice to see um, uh, people who did Pocket Quest last year, like ending up in the other channels on the Discord server and continuing to make things and, and whatnot. And it's, yeah, it's a really supportive community because it's every, everyone's making these games for fun and it's just an opportunity to do something a, a little different. And if you are, a, if you've already made some games, maybe stretch your wings a little bit and experiment. And if you haven't, it's, you know, I mean, it's a great chance to start out with a little bit of structure to help you. So you're not flying blind in space. We've got some guide guidelines. And uh, just also to clarify, can this be an adventure or does it have to be a standalone game? Uh, we prefer it be a standalone game, but you could definitely do a thing where like, here's the basic mechanics and here's the scenario. And I have actually seen some of some of them this year, and I assume some last year, um, 
were the sort of tabletop game where you're you, they're designed to play a very specific scenario or type of scenario as opposed to kind of traditionally a tabletop game is like you can do anything you want in this setting whereas these are like no you are telling the specific story of these asteroid miners who just all got laid off you know go forth <sighs> Cool. Um, and then if now uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about is like getting the word out there. So obviously I've got uh, my channel, a bit of a platform here that I like to share uh, indie game designs if possible. I came up with the concept of like a game pitch uh, almost from the video game world because you just don't see it in uh, tabletop role playing games like, you know, the people do the podcast circuit and that kind of thing. But I came up with the concept of uh, doing a game pitch. And I'm going to, if you just bear with me, I'm going to play the little, the idea behind it. And we'll be back in one minute. Just have a watch of this. Hey friends, are you looking for a game that is not Dungeons or Dragons? Well, we got exactly what you need at Daku Game Pitch. We got zines, we got OSR, we got adventures, but wait, there's more. We got solo games, we got journaling games, we even got card games and dice games. Oh hell, I don't even know what kind of game this is, but we got it. And if you visit us in the next two minutes, you're gonna get all the zine quests, zine months, itch fund and backer kits, kickstarters that you can't handle. Visit us at www.qgames.com and tell them a game pitch Gary sent ya. And we're back. So the I didn't realize game pitch Gary would be so attractive. Well, I can't keep up the accent for too long or the, the hat. And, you know, a lot of, I honestly, like, it was just kind of a whim thing. And part of the reason why I did it was, like, uh, there's kind of a bit of a taboo of, like, don't over-promote your games too much. And, like, you know, you got to kind of play it cool. And I thought, well, if I went completely overboard on, uh, like, a pitch man that uh, – you coming onto the channel and pitching your game wouldn't seem so bad. And, and yeah, that, that makes sense. There's definitely people who are like, I've made this thing, but I'm shy to talk about it, or I don't know how to talk about it in a way that can appeal to people. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's cool to have a, a place where that is a dedicated, like, no, 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 go ahead and chill because that's important. Getting, getting the word out is just as much of a job as making the game in a lot of cases. If nobody knows that you made a game, it almost might as well not exist. Unfortunately, yeah. I mean, games are meant to be played. Um, and obviously there's more games than we could ever re regularly play. But you, you definitely want to get some people playing your game. And, and, and that will help guide you when you start working on the, the next game. So I'm going to just pop it onto the screen here. If for some reason uh, you make a game, uh, for uh, Pocket Quest, and then you're going, hey, I want to get the word out there. What I've kind of got this 15-minute live stream pitch idea that you can come on uh, and pitch your game, uh, and there's a form on my website, daikugames.com slash game pitch. Fill it out and talk about it. I have to admit, my audience tends to be like almost entirely just kind of indie OSR kind of space, so if you feel that's a good fit, uh, you know, feel free to come on here and uh, fill out the form and I'll try to get back to you and schedule a 15 minute live stream. And it, the only thing I really require from you is a slide deck. And so it's completely up to you. I mean, if you've already made your game and you have the graphics and everything already, just make a slide deck. And, and the other thing that I want to kind of add on to the screen here and what I try to guide people to is when you send out your media kits, because I get a fair amount of them uh, through just, you know, unsolicited emails where people come to me and they go, hey, like I, I have a game and they send me the media kit. The things that I kind of look for is like, you know, does it evoke a nice vibe? Uh, this, if people have not seen this before, this is the Stranger Things Bible. And this is what the uh, Duffer Brothers used to promote Stranger Things. It was called the Montauk uh, experiment or situation, or I forget the correct term, but they did a really good job of like kind of going, this is a, like the vibe of it very minimal text. Here you can see they have a picture from ET. 
the project uh, Montauk project conspiracy. And then there, you know, the radar dish that ended up in the show and like they pull from other things like close encounters of the third kind. And this really just kind of sells your game. And often I get like a word document that I look at. And I really have to struggle to kind of find the story in the game, but do something like this. And uh, I encourage you, if you're coming on the, uh, game pitch put together a slide deck that essentially is this and just talk about the vibes of the game because that's really i think what sells it uh versus like long paragraphs of text is to you know put something like this together not everybody has like you know killer graphic design skills to make these types of things but you know a slide deck powerpoint or google slides it's all achievable i think so uh i really suggest like if you're going to come on or you're going to send out media kits, put something together like that. That's a little bit more of like, this is the, the vibe I'm after. Yeah. I mean, that sounds great. And I mean, that's also something that I encourage people to do that sort of brainstorming about their, their own project, whether it's a game or whether it, they're writing a story or whatnot is collect the stuff that inspires you and that gets you in the mood. And that also like, that you would use by way of analogy to tell somebody, you know, obviously like the, the uh, stranger things when they're pulled in like parts of ET and parts of some other films. And it's like, because that, that's how we explain things a lot of times to people is we say, Oh, it's, it's X plus Y, or it's like, imagine if this happened, but this didn't happen. How is this going to change things? Um, and you can do that in, a couple pages in a lot of cases, um, you know, a little bit of art, some text, just talk about like the, not just like the, the setting of it, like the, but like the theme of it, like what sort of feelings is this game supposed to evoke? What are you trying to do? And from a, like a, a businessy point of view, like who is this supposed to appeal to? Um, obviously, like, you know, Stranger Things, for example, had, a, you know, a huge appeal to people in their 30s and 40s who grew up in the 80s and are like, oh, yeah, I, I kind of, I remember the world being like that. I don't remember the alien part. I don't remember that. But I, I was watching Stranger Things with somebody who was 10 years younger than me when it was newly coming out. And at one point, they just yelled, was that what growing up was like for you? And I was like, yeah, like I didn't have the big forest by my town, but like I rode around on my bike all day um, and nobody knew where the heck I was. So you want to you want to you're, you're making a pitch to people. You want to give them some touchstones that they can easily sort of start filling in the blanks. Um, and, and that's even when you're thinking about, like, how do I describe my game in one sentence and then if somebody's like, okay, that sounds cool. How, what do you tell them next to keep them nodding? And where do you, where do you go detail wise? And it helps to think about your game in that way. You know, like wh what would somebody ask me if I told them this? And you can do that. You can just, I mean, I, I direct message my best friend all the time with like an out of context idea just to see what, how he says, you know? And oftentimes it's like the hand over the face emoji, like, Adam, please stop, you know? And, then, and when he does that, I'm like, okay, I'm onto something good. Um, but yeah, like figure out like what, how do people react to your pitch and where do you want to guide them from there? Cause what are you trying to do? Because the ultimate thing with a, a game is you, you want to connect, your audience shouldn't be people who love tabletop games. Your audience, you need to narrow it down to like people who are familiar with this and want this sort of experience, you know, people who want a game about exploring the emotions of space, the vastness of space, but also it's got to be a two player game, you know, and you've got to hone in on that and figure out how do I make the game that appeals to those people? What are the essential functions of a two player game? Because if you try to do the like, I'm making the game that everyone's going to play. You're, you're going to make a muddled mess, unfortunately. Yeah. And that's uh, often, uh, I'm sure you see it all the time is somebody that has uh, aspirations to be the next D and D and appeal to like a wide audience. And the, the magic is in the niche of like very, as you said, um, specific experience that you're trying to create or an emotion that you're trying to evoke or just a vibe that you go like, if you're going to play this game, maybe only once in your life, this is the experience that you're going to get. 
And right. And even if you have notions of making a bigger game that is more all encompassing, I'm, I'm going to use Savage Worlds as my example here. You know, it's one of a top 10 role playing game right now, maybe top 10 role playing game of the past 25 years, but it started as Deadlands. It was one specific thing that had a really cool hook and it had amazing art. It had those orange covers that just stood out on the shelf and it was cool. And Pinnacle got people into Deadlands specifically, and then they branched out into, hey, here's Savage Worlds. Here's this game that is similar, but you can do more things with it. And then from that branch out, then they were like, here's more settings and whatnot. So they they started narrow and grew broader, as opposed to starting with the broad thing and going narrower. Well, I think uh, you know you have a lot of good advice. Um, I'm anxious to see, like, you're excited to see uh, a lot of the products that come out of uh, Pocket Quest 2023 and the, the theme of space, which is pretty broad. And I'm sure there's going to be some interesting takes on it. But uh, as far as drive-through RPGs uh, goes, I know uh, you uh, one bookshelf is the actual, I think, official operating name, and you merged with Roll Twenty this last year. How's it, how's it been with the merger and I'm sure there's like lots of efficiencies and that you're like kind of trying to find out. Yeah, it's been, I mean, super exciting. Um, I definitely, you know, when it was announced to us, I was like, okay, this is cool. Like I'm really excited about this. Um, and obviously, you know, two companies, you know, moving together and uh, you know, getting our figuring out, who integrates into what departments and that kind of thing. It's definitely been a process, um, but everyone at Roll20, it, they're super cool people. They're a lot of fun to work with. We've been having a great time and there's so much to learn internally about how how different things work and, and we're like, you know, we're still constantly kind of like, wait, on, on Roll20, what happens if X, Y, and Z? How do your coupons work again? Like, there's all sorts of technical stuff to figure out. And, but also a lot of like great brainstorming and coming up with future ideas for how to integrate things more tightly and how to, you know, how to leverage our strengths together, both as, you know, people who are creative, but also as, you know, a business entity doing things, you know, efficiently. Um, and one of the cool things is uh, starting in January, there are uh, DMs Guild, Dungeon Master Guild titles that you can buy on drive through and it will unlock that content on Roll20 as well. Uh, and we actually just launched some Pathfinder Infinite and Starfinder Infinite titles that do the same. You can probably assume that more of that's going to be coming in the future as we uh, both work on the technical side of things, but also figuring out what works and what people want. Um, and Rule 20 has been doing some great strides in improving the actual VTT uh, recently, uh, which is not my field of expertise, but I know I've seen the, the fan reaction to the, the improvements. And that's like where the metal meets the road, right? Do the fans actually like this? And they seem really excited about some of the new toolbar improvements and dynamic lighting improvements, um, video and audio improvements. I can't quote the exact numbers for how we've improved it, but it is much better than it used to be. Um, so it's just, it, it, it's fun to be in a bigger company and having a lot of moving pieces and a, and a lot of opportunities to toss out expertise and also learn. Cool. Well, uh, obviously, uh, drive through RPG is like one of the best uh, platforms out there. Uh, I appreciate it from my perspective, and I'm sure a lot of game designers appreciate that, as well as like little initiatives uh, like this for uh, Pocket Quest. So, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens. And uh, Adam, I just want to say, you know, thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. It was great to hang out. <laughs>